Welcome, everyone, to the sixth and last session of ICFA's and PHAP's learning stream on humanitarian coordination. Today's event will focus on government-linked coordination mechanisms in general and on the Refugee Convention uh, Coordination Model, the RCM, a mechanism led by host governments in collaboration with UNHCR. My name is Mark DeBron. I'll be your co-facilitator today on behalf of PHAP. I'm an independent consultant and an analyst based in London, and PHAP, if you don't know it, stands for the International Association of Professionals in Humanitarian Assistance and Protection. This event is made possible by ICFA and through the Geneva Humanitarian Connector, an initiative of PHAP supported by the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs. Yes, and hello everyone, hello Mark, and welcome. I'm Emmanuel Osmond, I'm an IGVA co-host for today's session. I am Senior Policy Officer covering Humanitarian Coordination at IGVA. I can see already that we have quite a number of participants today coming from different places in the world, from Ghana, Finland, Palestine, Thailand, so hello everyone. Before we start the session, I would like to thank our donors who provide support to IGVA, Danida, Germany, IKEA, Swedish CIDA, ECO, Switzerland, and all also, IGVA's member to make this learning session a reality. Thank you, Mark. So, over the series of uh, learning stream sessions on uh, humanitarian coordination, we have been uh, mainly look looking at the ISC coordination model. So, today's session, we will look at government-led coordination model, as governments are supposed to be the first responders to crises. We will also look at refugees' context and the link between refugee coordination model and the other coordination systems. Our NGO colleagues will describe the opportunities, challenges, and share their best practices in engages, in engaging in these uh, country mechanisms, coordination mechanisms. Now I let Mark uh, introduce our first speakers of today. All right. Uh, with uh, Paul Harvey, we'll first explore the basic notions of the role of the state in humanitarian response and the principles and main challenges surrounding government-led coordination. Paul is partner at Humanitarian Outcomes and has worked in humanitarian action for over 20 years as an aid worker, researcher, and consultant. One of his research areas has been the role of states in humanitarian action. Immediately following Paul's presentation, we'll have a presentation from Vikrant Mahajan. Vikrant is uh, uh, going to be discussing uh, the situation in India and how NGOs can participate in strengthening government-led coordination structures to better respond to humanitarian needs. Vikrant is the CEO of Sphere India, a national coalition of humanitarian agencies in India since 2007, leading on issues such as humanitarian coordination, collaborative advocacy, and capacity sharing in, in India. Manuel? Yes, and uh, these presentations will be followed by Arafat Jamal, who will uh, introduce us to the refugee coordination model and also relevant structure for humanitarian action and coordination, which is led by each host government in collaboration with UNHCR. So Arafat is a senior UN official uh, with over 20 years of international experience focused on emergencies. He currently works at the, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR, where he heads the Interagency Coordination Service, which focuses on fostering inclusive and optimized collaboration in order to meet refugee needs as efficiently as possible. Then Patricia Roy Akulo will explain her own experience working in such a refugee response model in Uganda. Uh, Patricia works for Act Alliance member Dan Church Aid, DCA, as their advocacy officer for the Uganda Forum. She engages in national and regional level advocacy on climate change and DRR, among other advocacy issues pertinent to the forum. Now, Mark, over to you. Well, that's an exciting set of panelists for today. Uh, Paul, the floor is yours to get us started. Thank you. So as Mark said, I'm with Humanitarian Outcomes. I'm going to be talking today based on work I did when I was with the Humanitarian Policy Group at the Overseas Development Institute looking at the role of the state in humanitarian action, and then some follow-up work I did for ALNAP and the Red Cross around the same issue, and the study I did for OSAID around um, coordination in the Asia-Pacific region. Um, all of that slightly added, well, all of that was a while ago, so it's, uh, you know, the, 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 the research and the examples I'll be drawing on are slightly out of date. Um, I'll be presenting a slightly critical version of the uh, the way in which international aid actors work with governments to respect and promote government-led coordination. And so I'll, I, you know, I'll hope that it's all improved over the last few years and that you tell me and my, my research is hopefully out of date and international aid is doing a great job of, of working with government now. Um, uh, but I'll be presenting a sort of general overview. Um, the, the first point I guess to say is, is that you know, making a distinction between ISC coordination and government-led coordination is part of the problem. All Coordination should be government-led. It's very clear in um, 
uh, and commitments by donors and aid agencies in sort of international law, but, but the, the state has the primary role to assist and protect its citizens, and that includes coordination in times of disasters. It's clearly recognised in the sort of UN 46182 that's on the screen. Um, it's clearly recognised. How do we? Sorry, I uh, remembered. Um, it's clearly recognised in the IDRL, the International Disaster Response Law Guidelines from the uh, from the Red Cross, um, and uh, and in you know other forms of commitments like the humanitarian donorship. Uh, so the sort of, you know it should be clear. Um, in practice, it's often been problematic. Um, this was just sorry the, the research I'm presenting. Let's get through that. So when I started the the research. The working hypothesis were that the role of the state has been relatively injected by international humanitarian actors, that the relationship between government officials and international disaster agencies in all sorts of crises was often fairly dysfunctional, um, that as aid workers, as an aid worker myself, a lot of your job is about relating to state actors and national authorities at different levels, um, but that that is you know, relatively neglected. Um, and in the, but this is a sort of slightly odd period in history in that sense. The state used to play a much more central role in, in, in disaster assistance, uh, but the 90s and 2000s saw the sort of increasing dominance of an international humanitarian system with international funding for humanitarian aid largely flowing through international aid agencies. And, uh, and that this is uh, sort of problematic in some way. Um, moving on uh, to talk about some specific examples. So, and Governments do play a central role both in responding to disasters and coordinating to disasters. This is a picture of, of Pakistan in the earthquake response where the military played a central and, and, and often sort of commended role. Um, but clearly in, other, you know, in, in the same context at other points it can be problematic. And it's the military's role in displacement arising from the conflict in 2009 where the government was both a sovereign authority but an active part of the conflict was, was more problematic. And this is another area where sort of guidance is limited. The, the, the guidance on how international aid actors relate to militaries is often more focused on how international aid actors relate to sort of international peacekeeping forces and international militaries than it is to national militaries. Um, and and part of the problem is a sort of a, a lack of guidance around principles. Um, aid agencies are, are committed to sort of core humanitarian principles of independence and neutrality and but, but what that means for how they relate to national authorities is, is often underanalyzed. Um, and uh, in practice, aid workers have tended to cite neutrality and independence as reasons for keeping the state at arm's length as a shorthand for disengagement from the state uh, in ways that, that can often be problematic. And there's also problems of sort of how, how donor governments in particular sort of reconcile their simultaneous commitments to humanitarian, respecting humanitarian principles of independence and neutrality to development principles of, of alignment, ownership and harmonization with, with government um, and fragile state and, and donors themselves have often sort of failed to think about this sufficiently. So they, they in, in all sorts of contexts where there are not neat distinctions between humanitarian development and action and, and state building within fragile state sort of agendas. Uh, they're overlapping, and you don't move neatly from humanitarian to support fragile states for development. You need to be simultaneously doing all three things. Um, and so, what this means for coordination is that while it's clear in, in and, and commitment that governments should lead, in practice, governments are often problematically marginalised, or the way in which governments and international aid agencies are working with each other is problematically dysfunctional. And and that you know, continues to be found in a series of evaluations, in evaluations of how the cluster system works, in evaluations of individual disasters. Time and time again, the the way in which the coordination system works with local and national actors and local authorities and governments at different levels is deeply problematic. And Haiti was a Haiti earthquake, an example of that. Um, this is a picture of the presidential palace. Um, and clearly, you know, the earthquake severely disrupted the ability of, 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 of government, severely disrupted ministries in, in, in Port-au-Prince. Um, but the you know, evaluations, again, criticised the international response to yet again marginalising government actors. Uh, there were examples of, of good practice, um, a need to be realistic about how badly government had been affected, um, but the real-time evaluation called for better support to key ministries to get them running. Run, run, run. In the the study I did for OzAid, we were looking in, in part at the, the Sumatra the earthquake in Indonesia. And what I found there when I was looking at it was you almost ended up with parallel coordination systems. 
the government had its own coordination system working with local and national actors in, in coordinating you know, the national response. And the international cluster system was almost working in parallel, in part because of a language problem. Um, the, uh, the international aid cluster system was working in English. Most government officials didn't speak English, and so they just stopped coming to meetings. You know, this, this created the sort of dysfunctional relationship that, that you see too often. Um, interestingly, one of the clusters had invested in simultaneous translation, and there the government officials kept coming. The cluster was working much better with government at different levels, and you know, even small fix like that was making a big, big difference. And I think language is actually a sort of under under analyzed problem in this respect. Um, in Latin America, coordination tends to work much better, I think, in part because international actors all speak Spanish and they, they're respecting the, the, the language of the uh, local authorities. I should go stop quite soon. I promise to take eight minutes, but I fear I've gone slightly over. Um, so why, when governments should lead in coordination, do they often not work effectively with international actors? Um, Partly it's obviously about the sort of definition of disasters and national capacities being overwhelmed. Partly in high profile disasters it's about the sudden influx of international aid agencies. Haiti was a good example of that, where governments are just somewhat overwhelmed by the hundreds of organizations that depend on them. Partly it's about the language issue I was talking about. Partly I think there's fundamental issues of sort of you know, the respect and, and um, you know, respect for sovereign authority of governments and that not always being as recognized by international staff and international aid agencies as it should be. Part of it's about the lack of guidance on principles that I was talking about. Part of it's about the lack of investment in preparedness. And uh, so to conclude, I, when I was doing the research, this was starting to shift. Um, it felt like there was a long overdue focus on the roles and responsibilities of the state in relation to humanitarian action. Um, hopefully that will continue as it has been continuing. Uh, but I fear you know, not as much or as consistently as it has been. And a good example of that, I think, is the way in which the localization debate is playing out. Far too much of that is about the slightly narrow question of, of how money flows to southern NGOs, when a far bigger and more important part of the globalization debate should be about how international aid action works with and in respect to national authorities. And, and so states need to still need to be brought more centrally back into debates around humanitarian action, including about how it's coordinated. Thank you very much. All right, Paul. Thank you very much for opening up this discussion. Uh, I'm going to move right to you now, Vic. Yeah, I think thank you, Paul. I think this was setting up uh, uh, in terms of principles of coordination, uh, calling the government, where the role of the government is, uh, and how do the civil society and the other actors look at the government role. Uh, I'm going to more delve into a, a case study from India, uh, wherein you know we a uh, group of uh, humanitarian stakeholders, uh, uh, known as Shri India Humanitarian Coalition, which is more than as of now 62 organizations at a national level and 17 sub-national coordination platforms which we have evolved. So how this system has evolved over a period of time and worked very closely with the government and support, uh, support and enable government-led coordination. It started uh, sometime around post-2006, post-humanitarian reforms in 2006, uh, to look at an alternative model for interagency coordination and it has been a learning process which evolved over a period of time. So the, when the objectives we look at our this was three, how we supplement the government coordination, uh, develop some common tools and consensus on the processes, and decentralize or enable locally-led coordination. So towards this, I will not delve more deep into the core beliefs, I think, for Paul, her previous president, has already presented that. But we at the government has a structure which is at a national level, state level, and a district level, which is NDMA, SDMA, and GDMA. And our efforts has been there to organize the civil society, humanitarian, other humanitarian actors to come together as platforms to work closely with the NDMA at Fair India at a national level and the state intelligence group at the state level. Whereas even at a district level, we have some somewhere we have district intelligence groups, where the district IAG, as we call them, or district committees, which work closely with district collectors. So, uh, as a part of the preparedness, we were, we start in the pre-disaster time itself to build uh, some partnership with the government, some doing some joint mayor delegation and missions, understanding, building some understanding and protocols, some also revising some plans and preparedness activities. The photograph we see is of a joint, the government geo and geo mission at during the uh, global platform for DRI in Kenkan. So the Minister of State for Home was there and the most of the civil society actors we sat together and brainstormed on some of the important actions which we agree on. The preparedness also continues to look at, you know, how we 
for vertically co uh, coordinate between various platforms. So we have the state level platforms called intelligence groups. So once in a year, we try to bring them together to look at the issues of coordination between various state IAGs as well as the national entities and the state actors. Then, you know, we also look at every year to initiate some new state platforms. As we say, we, are, we in India have 30 states. As of now, 17 states, the platforms are active. But every year, we work on to add one or two new state platforms so that you know, there is a state level platform available everywhere and our coordination go more local. Uh, we also look at how we strengthen the government system during the peace times by developing, you know, working with the government on emergency preparedness and disaster preparedness plans. This particular photograph is of a workshop which we did in a, one of a highly vulnerable state to strengthen the government emergency preparedness plan. And we have a space between these two all this to look at with the, pol the constructive policy advocacy, looking at how the situation of humanitarian financing is. Uh, the publication which we have on this malnutrition risk reduction and nutrition emergencies in India. So these are kind of our preparedness activities we do. Uh, we also, as a part of second objective, developing tools for coordination and, and some common processes. We have had a long evolution of our format as well as methodology. Now over a period of time of uh, successive learning over the years, we have been able to not only agree onto the format but also digitize it using uh, the digital platform collect real-time data from the field and get the real-time analysis to have a quick assessment information available to government and non-government actors to plan their responses. Again, as a part of coordination, then we see that how we have brought a role clarity among various actors, uh, who will do what and how, who is going to do what and where, mapping that information so that the real field level coordination get enabled. So for this, at a national level, coordination is where it's more more strategic. We try to come together to take a decision on the level of a disaster, whether it's a, it's a field level disaster, whether it's a state or a national level as L1, L2, L3. We have a, have a commonly agreed SOP that how we're going to get activated for our unified response and, you know, from this initial response coordination, what are the advocacy issues which we are coming up, we collect them. And wherever the need for the sectoral coordination is there, which is just like clusters, but we don't call them as, but we call it as a sector committee, start activating to look at the sectoral coordination issues and feed into the, the larger general coordination. Same way at the state level, the coordination is more operational, which works closely with the State Disaster Management Authority and looking at a horizontal coordination with the respective line departments of the, gov of the government at the state level. And as we go district, that's where the most of the action happen that are cutting legs at each level. So most of the, the implementing partners, they enter into sometimes a MOU with the district level authority. So the information, or we deploy the coordinator to the district collector's uh, office, so that, or the DDMA, so that the NGO coordination information collation regularly is shared with district authorities, as well as also the district itself is able to lead that coordination process. As well. In our effort to decentralize coordination, you know, we have been, as I said, we have been working on to develop the state intelligence Group. So as of now, 17 states have these intelligence group functional. The various colors shows the level of, you know, the uh, the preparedness or the level of at the effectiveness of these intelligence groups in India. So we we see that maybe by 2020, every Indian state would have a a state level localized coordination platform available and also how we're going to network the community level focal points together so that you know the there is also a network of community practitioners who is available to us as another another thing which is going to enable this coordination. And government is roped into it into all these activities as a collaborative partner. I think with this I had here as a time limit to me, maybe I will look at more questions during the question time. Thank you, Vic, for uh talking to us a little bit about the situation uh, in India. I'm now going to hand the floor over to Emmanuel to ask some follow-up questions to the two of you. Yes, thank you, Mark. We already have uh, some uh, follow-up questions. Actually, I've got one that I would like to share between uh, Paul and Vic uh, to have uh, both your overview on that. This is a question that was submitted by Jorn from Norway, um, and he asked in government-led systems, whom are governments accountable to in terms of their performance uh, in, this kind of, uh, in this kind of systems? And uh, Vic, if you can just explain also what exists in India uh, on that kind of system, System, it would be very useful. Thank you. Over to you, Paul, first, and then Vic. That managing disasters well can be politically popular, and that managing it badly can be politically unpopular. As uh, uh, that's witnessed by the you know, recent disaster responses in the U.S. Um, and, uh, and also in Latin America. Um, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, beyond that, it, 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 governments are sovereign; they're, they're not accountable, um, uh, you know, to to, to 
anyone else um, other than their own citizens. Yeah, uh, I think that Paul has said it very clearly. In my view, the government, uh, especially in the welfare state, government is accountable to its people. And there is instruments of accountability built within the constitution that how government can be held accountable, whether through the election systems or uh, uh, the judiciary, uh, the the, the law which is there to say there is and then you know a lot of a civil society and the people's movement uh, in India we see all these three into a very very dynamic way of you know bringing a mutual accountability uh, for the government speaking of some of the positive some of the experiences maybe I say that uh, we also in Spain India try to facilitate one exercise we call it rights in crisis uh, as a part of our advocacy so during the effective uh, affected areas so wherever our partners and uh, uh, NGO partners are responding we try to collate information from their sources as to their beneficiaries how much of the government announced entitlements as well as the government announced social protection schemes their beneficiaries have been able to access so this all the data from multiple NGO implementing partners is collected by Spare India and then we develop info infographics and share with the government district authorities the concerned officers that this is the information which has come from the state from the field and how they can help you know reach out so it is a more of a constructive partnership which we try to build with government so that reach out to to people uh, and and have a mutual accountability towards the whole uh, towards the beneficiaries you know so the very people we will aspire to serve. Maybe I need to hear if there are further questions that you can. Vic, uh, maybe if I could follow up with a question to you. Uh, we've got one from uh, Sundhan Shu Singh in, uh, in India. And uh, the question is this. Uh, in terms of the power balance uh, in the coordination mechanism there, you know, where does the power rest? Is it the local NGOs, the uh, international NGOs, or the national and registered uh, international NGOs? Um, you know, how, how do you see that playing out between these different groups? Well, uh, I think this is an interesting evolving uh, mechanism and the debate of this international, national and local lives has intensified since the grand bargain, World Humanitarian Summit and Sudanshu being one of the most vocal activists for that. Uh, the the power balance I, uh, to me is, I think we look at the groups at the various levels. The, the district level where most of the cutting edge activities happen is more of the implementing organizations who, who are in the action and are involved with the uh, partner with I involve the district authorities but as we go more uh, vertical at state and a national level the uh, it's more the national organizations and many of them may be you know as we are started classifying them in India as nationally registered international brands so uh, they they are there and the partnership model works. Now in terms of uh, uh, power balance between this, I think a lot of these NGOs, they apply principles of partnership and they try to look at their own self-evaluations onto that to see how much the power balance is between one entity to the very to the other one to say there is a very very organization specific to say there is in my uh, independent experience with our, uh, I see that maybe some of them are more uh, balanced in terms of and uh, also more outreaching to the to their partners in balancing this relationship and some of them may may not be that way so but I see that this is within the NGO system as a more of an evolving mechanism to say there is uh, in terms of uh, coordination yes uh, within Sphere India we also have been facing challenges in terms terms of our role with respect to the state I, state groups as we decentralizing it. So it has not been an easy journey between the state groups and the national group or the district groups. But we take it as, an, as, an, uh, as a learning uh, process uh, where more and more empowerment we are doing is that the state and the locally led groups have a more role and a more uh, visibility towards the coordination and the national structures is more to support the local ones. So we, within the national uh, body which I represent, we also try to see that the more power is towards the locally led groups is there. I'm not sure I've been able to address the question complete, but I, from my experience and perspective, I can be. And well, yeah, thank you, Vic. It's a, um, it's a big question and this is a short panel discussion. I think you did a good job of uh, telling from your experience the lay of the land in India, at least. With that, uh, and remembering that we're going to have a Q&A after the, our next two speech, uh, speakers, I'm going to give the floor to Arafat to talk to us about the refugee coordination mechanism. Thank you, Arafat.
Thank you very much. And first of all, a very big thanks to, to both ICVA and PHAP for organizing this and for all of you who turned up. And I noticed in the list of names a uh, few old friends and then lots of, of new people. So uh, good morning to all. I'm going to talk about uh, the um, what we call the refugee coordination model. Um, I have some slides, but essentially the overall questions that I'm trying to answer in it is what is the refugee coordination model? Why do we need it? How is it different from other models? And what are some future uh, options for it? Essentially, the refugee coordination model is, is uh, our means of operationalizing international protection for refugees. UNHCR has effectively led and managed refugee operations for decades, but it has not been very good at articulating a model of coordination that is widely understood and accepted or inclusive and straightforward. By contrast, the cluster system for IDPs has by now is well known and serves as something of a reference point for most people in humanitarian operations, whereas the refugee system, although it has been in place since 1951, is not as well understood or developed. We feel that the, um, the, the, uh, we, we need a, a refugee coordination model uh, in order to effectively exercise our leadership on refugee issues uh, and not risk undermining a mandated and hitherto well-recognized role of UNHCR in protecting refugees. The model itself is basically a framework for predictability, inclusion, and shared responsibility. And it clarifies roles. It's there to deliver timely, effective, and quality protection. It offers an inclusive platform, and it, and it uh, preserves accountability to and for refugees and persons of concern. And I think it's really this last point also that is that is very important um, for us. Why would we need uh, an RCM as opposed to other things? In a nutshell, it's about refugees as, um, as being people with a very specific vulnerability and a set of rights because of their particular status. So there, are, there may be people in need of humanitarian assistance as well, but they are not exclusively subjects of humanitarian assistance. They have they have wider needs. And this is essentially the underpinning of, of the RCM. A few uh, principles and, and approaches on the RCM. One is that the primary responsibility lies with governments, primary responsibility for refugee protection. Secondly, is that coordination should be concentrated at the point of delivery. And that, and that is in order to, to promote efficiency and to prevent duplication. Thirdly, is that coordination and operational delivery is accountable for and to refugees. Refugees are part of the structures, and they must continue to, to influence the decision making through, through their involvement. Fourthly, there's a potential for, for combining coordination arrangements and mechanisms as, as through the joint note with OCHA. And then the fifth point is what we call integral yet distinct, that, we, uh, that, that refugee coordination must be integral to an overall humanitarian vision in a given country, but it must in order to create duplication or inefficiencies. Rather, it is to preserve a clear line of accountability for the protection of these people. The following I'm not going to go through in detail, but it gives an example of what an RCM structure might look like. And a lot of our work is, is actually spent on trying to um, come up with the, um, with the optimal structure for, for a given situation. But this, is, this uh, before you is a, a model um, structure. Uh, this, this slide is, is um, it shows a little bit about, uh, about our partnership, and it also, um, it also quantifies it. Uh, some, sorry, the next, it's a further slide that quantifies it. But this shows numbers of, of partners that we work with and the breakdown between international, national, and government and UN agencies. Um, it's important to note uh, in, uh, for this slide and the, and the, uh, the other one that includes financial uh, information that partnership, of course, is not limited um, to, to money. And this is, uh, this is a, an important point, I think, for UNHCR because UNHCR is both, a, in a sense, a direct uh, implementer in terms of protection. It is a coordinator, and it is also, in some cases, a donor. And this, um, this can sometimes create uh, some amount of of confusion, but I think it is also it can also be used as a strength if we understand it properly. How are NGO partners involved? Um, they're involved in everything, starting from the strategy, 
through to the operational uh, decisions. Uh, if there's one principle of the RCM, it's that it's an inclusive platform and that it is planning for refugees, for refugee needs, and not for our programs. Um, we must start with the objective of needs in mind, uh, and it's not about individual programs. And, and, um, and all relevant uh, partners, whether they be NGOs or, or UN agencies or others, um, should contribute, the, at least in theory. The plan is that, is that we have a plan. It's an inclusive plan under UNHCR leadership with the host government, but it's a plan that, that, um, that genuinely includes all partners, whether they be implementing partners or financed by us or operational partners with their own independent means. This is the slide about um, uh, the sheer amount of money that we disperse to partners, but as I said, its partnership should not be viewed in exclusively financial terms. Uh, this slide speaks to a little bit about the, the different systems uh, that we have in place and how, and how we view them. Uh, obviously, like all, like all diagrams, it's neater than, um, than, than the reality. But um, what we view it is that there, are distinct, uh, that there are distinct yet overlapping circles. And obviously, the challenge is in, uh, is in the places of overlap. And we try to, um, we try to complement to the extent possible. In particular, with the cluster system, we have uh, we we do it through a joint note with OCHA and with the um, development system. We are now drawing upon uh, for for refugees. The joint note uh, with OCHA is um, it determines how we coordinate in in, uh, in mixed situations. It's a uh, I think it's an it's an interesting attempt because at a certain point uh, there was a lot of questioning about clusters versus the the refugee coordination model sectors and. Um, what we did was we came up with this with this joint note in 2014, and we both defined what a mixed situation was, and then we um, spoke about the different arrangements uh, that that should be put in place. Our basic belief is that a healthy and functioning humanitarian system is one that harnesses diversity and expertise to bring the best outcomes for affected people. And it should be based on comparative advantage, which we feel comprises mandate, responsibility, expertise, and capacity. And um, the, the joint note uh, with OCHA is an example of a document that delineates respective responsibilities, and it underlines the principle that refugee coordination is led by UNHCR, and it is an integral yet distinct component of the wider humanitarian response. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the New York Declaration and the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework. Um, we, uh, we have, uh, since our inception, supported the greater integration of humanitarian with development issues. Uh, the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework comes from the New York Declaration of last year, an impressive document signed by 193 states. Um, and it builds upon existing me mechanisms, including the refugee uh, coordination model, to more broadly ease pressure on host countries, enhance refugee self-reliance, and expand access to third country solutions. The RCM provides the foundation for the immediate and effective assistance, and it builds towards uh, the CRRF. And I think that um, our next speaker will be talking about Uganda, which is one of our, our target areas for the CRRF. Finally, in, uh, in closing, uh, where, do we, where do we go from here? And while I've presented uh, what looks like a well-established uh, well model uh, that, that is, um, perhaps um, might look more solid than it is, I think that we are at a crossroads today. And um, we are asking questions about where we should head, including is the, is the model as such valid given, uh, given current debates uh, about the, the future of multilateralism, given debates about the importance of status, and um, uh, is, uh, is, the, um, is it working uh, as, as a model? Uh, and what, what other models might there, might there be in place? And I'll end over here. Thank you. Thank you, Arafat, for that uh, interesting uh, presentation on the RCM. And, and thank you for being very realistic about the fact that it's uh, sometimes our, our diagrams and organograms are a little bit neater than the reality on the ground. Um, people, before we, uh, before we move on to Patricia, can, uh, you've got two polls in front of you. Can I encourage a 
couple more of you to 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 vote on these uh, and give us give us your input. Uh, and then in the meantime, uh, Patricia, the floor is yours to describe the situation and how you've seen this um, playing out in Uganda, a country certainly um, right in the middle of the the refugee issue right now in the world. Thank you, Patricia. I'll be presenting experience in Uganda. So Uganda as a, a refugee hosting nation, Uganda has been hosting refugees since it gained independence in 1962. And the refugees we are having come from several countries, including the Democratic Republic of Congo, Burundi, Somalia, Eritrea, Kenya, Rwanda, and South Sudan. So most of the surrounding countries to Uganda are faced with uh, armed conflict. So the nature of refugees we are hosting are a result of armed conflict, so not, uh, not, not uh, natural uh, situation. So this also means that the, the, the government of Uganda is closely engaged with the refugee, with the refugee uh, situation because it's a security issue when the refugees are from armed conflict. And uh, Uganda is currently hosting about 1.3 million refugees and asylum seekers. As of the latest data, we have together with UNHCR uh, as of this October, of which uh, about 1 million are only South Sudan refugees. And most of these refugees are uh, women and children. You find about 52% of the refugees are uh, women and children are uh, make 61% and a bit of elderly people. And um, I'm trying to move, oh, sorry, I'm just trying to move my slide again. Okay, so the refugee coordination model in Uganda is government-led. Government means the office of the prime minister and it's jointly done with the UNHCR. And um, what does this mean, therefore, is that uh, the, the, the role of the of government is very streamlined, it's very prominent, and the office of the prime minister uh, plays a very big role in decision-making in this case. And um, so the office of the prime minister plays a very critical role on how the development actors are engaging with their service delivery to the refugees. So, it also means that uh, once refugees have crossed into Uganda, it's the OPM that takes charge of the security, food and safety, which is the mandate of government, just like uh, the previous speaker mentioned. The, um, and OPM, together with the uh, UNHCR, work closely. And this means that uh, whenever UNHCR has to, to engage in certain decisions, they have to seek the, the role of the OPM. And it also goes as far as selection of uh, implementing partners that UNHCR wants to support, and the government therefore makes the final decision on which development actor can deliver services within the, the refugee settlement. And like this, like, like how, because to show how prominent the, the government role is, that whereas UNHCR can provide a list of who can work within the service delivery areas in the settlement, it is still OPM that will make the final say on which actor actually can, can participate. And this goes as far as accessing the settlements. Even if you would want to simply go and have a learning or a visit to the settlements, you have to have clearance from the office of the prime minister. So that's how much control the government is engaged in this, in the coordination of work of refugee response in Uganda. And um, we really looked about decision making. So whereas government may not have as much funding, that's where UNHCR roles become very prominent because UH UNHCR has the, the funding, and uh, including the partners that are supported by UNHCR, the implementing partners, and other operating partners within the settlement. So it doesn't matter how much money you're bringing on the table, government will still be, will still be the lead here. And uh, I could just, for our uh, purpose of information, is that uh, we'll, we'll have about 58 organizations engaging in refugee response in Uganda, all coordinated by OPM together with UNHCR. This has grown from 39 in 2015, so within double of, of operating partners in the settlement, but also this is because the number of refugees has, has, has gone beyond um, the million mark we've been talking about. Okay, and um, we, how is the government coordination model also felt within the implementing the development actors? So, whereas the as as when refugees arrive, the the coordinations are more frequent because there's a lot of of things to be put together. But as as they settle, as the refugees get to settle a little bit, then uh, the meetings can shift into into the at a monthly uh, period. 
So the partners coordination normally takes place at sexual level. So UNHCR sector focal persons under the OPM guidance will meet. So this is again to emphasize that under the OPM guidance. So it means that most of the well, not all the, the sector coordination meetings happen with, within the presence of the government. And um, we also say that uh, the, the, the settlements have, um, have government officials that manage them and we are from the office of the prime minister and they, they are called the commanders. Commandant is like, is like a military or an army term for a commander. And we've also behind the scenes discovered over time that these people are actually having military trained backgrounds to manage their settlements and they have assistants at lower levels who are called. So you find that government has such a group on the operations of, uh, of development partners in the settlement and um, we say that the coordination is normally done jointly. So that's what normally happens and what, what could be the challenge? Uh, that's Quickly, the next slide. What could be the challenge with such models? So, one challenge is in terms of planning and programming. It means that NGOs have limited freedom to choose an area of operation, and because you cannot wake up one day with all your basket of money and and think you're going to operate in area X, because then government may decide in area X it is this particular partner that has to work in, and then you have to go to area Y. So as a development partner, you need to have a high level of flexibility in terms of geographical coverage that you can work in, and in terms of the sector that you can engage in. So it's, it's, it, there's a little bit of limited freedom to choose that, and then you have to, it also comes in that uh, UNHCR then guides you. And uh, sometimes, uh, I think UNHCR has as mentioned that when development partners, operating partners show a need to come and deliver in a certain area, they can take about six months to come back to deliver service in that area, which is not fine because you might find that the refugees or the beneficiaries have already died. So UNHCR has to quickly find another partner to cover in that gap. And by the time you come back, you may think that you can still work there, but then you cannot work there. And um, also with this model, you, the challenge with this model is that you can easily encounter problems with the authorities. And because it's government, it means that if you step government feet, that a little bit of chance that you could have your operation license revoked. Because remember, I earlier mentioned that the, the, the permission to operate in a settlement, the final list that UNHCR provides the, to the government is, is the, the final list approval is done by the government. So it means that you can also easily be dropped or have your activities uh, stopped, which has not yet happened anyway. So you, you trade a little bit careful on government stalls and, uh, and then a little bit of government pressure during M and E years. So this is a case whereby it's not maybe not to be quoted, but you may have a little bit of of tension uh, trying to satisfy some government individuals in terms of corruption and them demanding for allowances when they, they support you or give you a license. It, it looks a little bit of, but um, these are some, some challenges that can easily arise. They're not brought out very strongly, but if you're working within the settlement, you're likely to experience such a situation. Okay, and whereas it's still government, we have opportunities under this challenge. And this is where, as development actors, we strive to look at opportunities in such a setting of working in, in a government-led um, coordination model. So within this model, there are it means that NGOs or development actors can concentrate more on service delivery and resource mobilization. This is because uh, well, the development actors do what they do best in providing life-saving assistance to refugees and communities. This is because government has ensured that the operational environment system from border points settlements are ensured. So as development actors, you worry less because the government has already established an operational system. And also, government will also negotiate land, land from the host communities. So. As development actors, we do not have to worry where to where to to host the refugees. It's government mandate to negotiate with the land landlords, the landowners within the the areas that government has demarcated to host refugees, and government has more authority to speak to their communities and also to to speak the language that the community best understands and. Thereafter, also participate in resolving land-related conflicts between the host communities 
and and the beneficiary refugees. So this uh, makes uh, development actors have more time to engage in actual service delivery. And um, also this model therefore means that government can regulate the policy of 70-30% where we are talking of uh, as we deliver services to refugee beneficiaries, 70%. The 30% should go to the host communities. This reduces uh, the host and refugee uh, tension because they are living in an integrated settlement. Uh, Uganda does not hold, uh, run camp, it runs settlements. So they are living in an integrated community and sharing same resources like schools and hospitals. So we cannot be feeding refugees, giving food rations here 100%. And then the host community is also hungry because sometimes it's, it's bad season and there's no food. So the, the policy of, of 30% will, will nurture the relationship between host communities and refugees. So this model uh, of government-led ensuring such a policy is, uh, is adhered to. And also because it's a government-led model, it, in, it enables the communities or oh, the refugee community to access government services and facilities in terms of schools and hospitals because government is involved in the whole coordination process. It can therefore approve easily certain, um, uh, approve certain actions and also push for more funding into, into service points that have pressure from host and refugee community. So such a model uh, allows, such, uh, allows for this happen and uh, also it means that with such a model government can facilitate legal legal issues uh, refugees come when they do not have some of that documentation or need scholarship so this model allows for government to facilitate to facilitate or expedite process of search for people who need it because government is directly in charge of all these refugees and um, uh, another opportunity that we have within the, I'll go to the next slide, and that is my second last slide, I think, is that um, within this model, we are able to influence the best practices, and this means that uh, government is on the same table with, uh, with UNHCR and development partners during coordination meetings. So when there are certain good uh, uh, practices or innovations by development actors, it means that uh, government can be can easily buy into it and promote it and I think we have an example where Dan Church Aid has uh, run a cash transfer program in the settlement and the model has quickly spread out around and government approved of this model because also it means that uh, the refugees get the services they deserve and, and corruption and all these sentences are uh, uh, minimize and within this model still there's room for discussion with government it's not that when they are in charge then it's difficult for the others to speak so government has goodwill and cooperation in this case because they have the interest of the refugees at heart and um, I think also within this model government appreciates the magnitude of the challenges that the, uh, that uh, exist in refugee response or humanitarian response so this means that government is able to coordinate. So if somebody is a part of a situation, they understand it and they can cooperate much better. So because government is directly engaged and is the lead here, it actually sometimes takes lead or the initiative to reach out to development actors to try and, and cover up a gap that has been identified. So this means that the development actors are able to, to, to work better with government because they all understand each other. And, uh, and also within this model, government can regulate in terms of geographical coverage. It looks like a challenge before, but this means that government can tell that in, in section, in, a, in village A, there's no development partner working in, in a given sector. Therefore, it should try and spread out the different development actors to reach to, this, to these different areas. So this coordination model ensures that all, all areas that are hosted by refugees have all the services required by the refugees by the different development actors and not just concentrated in one, one settlement or in one area and other refugees cannot benefit. So government regulates geographical and sexual allocations so that there's good use of resources by development actors, efficient use of resources. And um, this coordination model, because it's also uh, having a lot of 
uh, UNHCR role. UNHCR brings to the table a very a new learning it has acquired over years from different countries or regions as it responds to humanitarian crisis. So this wealth of experience empowers most of the NGOs and new entrants in the field of humanitarian work to deliver ably. Yeah, so UNHCR gives, brings on a guiding role and, and good experience. And um, uh, uh, finally, and also UNHCR as a UN agency in this kind of model has a high level of authority and immunity and can easily task government to deliver on, on its mandate within this model. So this level of checks and balance offers an ample environment for NGOs to implement own activities. So this, this basically means that whereas we are in a government-led model, UNH, uh, uh, jointly with UNHCR, UNHCR can easily speak out or task government because of its status as it is UN. So where development partners may not uh, um, evaluate or check government role, UNHCR can easily do that. And um, and finally, and finally, that's our last slide. This is Act Alliance, and we, we believe stronger together, the better. We are 140 organizations in about 120 countries. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. It sounds like a, well, a very challenging situation in Uganda, and uh, very interesting to hear your views of it. Uh, we've got a little bit of time, so maybe I'd like to ask a follow-up question to, uh, to Arafat. Uh, Arafat, um, We've got a question from Jessica in the United States um, asking about tension between OCHA and UNHCR uh, in some of these contexts and how that works out. And then we've got another question from Sudanshu uh, mentioning IOM and uh, know that the situation, for instance, in Bangladesh is, is quite complex in terms of the relationship between UNHCR and, and IOM. And I don't know about more generally, but can, can you maybe speak to this for a bit about how, you know, at the UN level, um, the, the, the oh, I guess it's just a, a little bit of a turf, attention on turf is being handled. Yeah, th thank, thank you, uh, Paul, and for those um, very easy questions. Um, yeah, OCHA and, and IOM uh, are, uh, in, in a way, close partners, but also where there's, there has been sometimes uh, structural and other types of tension between them. I think diversity and expertise, and um, and so ideally we should be able to work together. In practice, uh, we do we do hit tension points, and those tension points uh, are sometimes, but I would say actually a, a minority of them are, are turf issues, as, as as you mentioned. I think they're more. They're often more due to either conceptual, uh, different ways of conceptualizing a situation, or just unclarity on, on who should do what and leading to confusion on the ground. So I mentioned already the 2014 UNHCR-OCHA joint note on, on mixed situations. Uh, I think that um, while it's certainly not a perfect note, it did lay down um, certain principles of how we operate. And it also quite importantly said that in a mixed situation, we will use either sectors or clusters. We will not use both, and we will not overload the field uh, with two, um, two uh, overlapping systems. Uh, and also, we will preserve clear lines of, of accountability. So I think that's gone quite a way um, towards, towards kind of straightening the path uh, with uh, with OCHA, that doesn't mean everything is, is smooth sailing, but it has it has worked um, a while, uh, worked some good. The basic, however, there is a more fundamental problem I think, which is we conceive of refugees as a particular population with a particular status, and we f we feel that that status both confers upon it certain vulnerabilities as well as certain rights, whereas um, the humanitarian system as such is about affected people. It is about um, Now, the two are, are very closely linked, and refugees, of course, often have acute humanitarian needs as well. However, our approach to refugees goes beyond humanitarian needs, and it begins the moment the person is a refugee, and it doesn't end until a solution is found, which may be 20 years down the line, and which may um, or may even be generations down the line. So there's also some sometimes uh, different conceptualizations that lead to different approaches. 
Vis-a-vis -vis IOM and Bangladesh, uh, I think you're obviously hitting on, on a hot spot um, right now. The official position is quite clear, and the Secretary General has pronounced upon this. It's a, it's a, a, it's a pure refugee situation in Bangladesh, uh, and as such, uh, uh, refugee coordination should be in place. However, there is a wider picture there, including the fact that IOM has very, um, uh, in, in a very positive manner, has stepped up over the, over the past few years. It has fulfilled an important role in Bangladesh, and therefore the facts on the ground speak to, to them being an effective operator on the ground. Uh, at the moment, it's a massive emergency. Um, I think there's more than enough work for everybody. Our approach is to focus on delivery, to focus on protection, and to see to what extent we can ease the strain on Bangladesh and that we can be part of a solution. So we are working together with IOM and OCHA and, of course, the Bangladesh government on this situation. It's a different, it's certainly a different uh, way of working, uh, but the important thing is to focus on, on, on the refugees themselves and see what we can do together. Thank you very much, Arafat. So I've got also a follow-up uh, follow question for Patricia. Um, Patricia, this is a, a question from Paul based in the UK and is asking, is there any tension between the uh, government office in uh, Uganda and UNHCR? Because the process sounds highly politicized. Does this cause delay and inefficiencies in delivery? Yeah, so it doesn't look very terrible, maybe as I found it. The government is very cooperative because it also knows that uh, the refugees, when they're not uh, provided with the services they need in time, can easily cause other uh, not so nice situations. So government is very cooperative, and the UNHCR and government have an extremely cordial relationship. So they, they're always on the table, and they, they have uh, government of Uganda has gone ahead to integrate the, um, the refugee issue into the national development plan. So government of Uganda knows that the, it has to achieve its national development plan too, that refugees are, are, are being integrated into. So it will work very well with the UNHCR to ensure that's achieved. Remember, government of Uganda doesn't have that much funding to, to realize its mandate under the national development plan. So it will work very well with UNHCR and its development partners that have the funding to ensure that's achieved. So it, it, it doesn't make them delay or make it difficult for development partners. It simply tries to regulate and ensure that everything goes to plan. Yeah, that's what I can say. Thank you, Patricia. Um, thank you very much. I think with that, we will now move to our more open Q&A, uh, bringing in uh, our earlier speakers, Paul and Vic. And maybe, uh, Paul, can I start with a question to you? Uh, we've gotten a number of our, our listeners out there who are concerned about the situation where uh, the government military uh, plays a major role in responding to uh, uh, whatever kind of crisis. And, uh, you know, what, what are some of the lessons learned about that, and in particular, uh, in conflict situations? And should, should the military be having access to vulnerable populations? Um, that question came, again, from a number of places. So, Paul, to you. Yeah, I'm not sure I have a terribly good answer. Um, so clearly, you know, governments play important roles in disaster response, and often that's sort of, you know, mandated in natural disasters. So, you know, the, 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 the example I gave of the, the, the Pakistan military's role in the, the response to the earthquake in Pakistan, um, the uh, the recent role of the U.S. military in Houston, you know, and there's, there's any number of examples of militaries playing, you know, legitimate roles and, and sort of mandated roles in response to natural disasters. Clearly, if, in a conflict, if a if a military is an active part of the conflict, um, then it gets more tricky. Um, and you know, this is where international humanitarian law comes in. That you know, there's the mandated role of the, the ICRC. That you know, there's all sorts of complications. The the fact that the military is an active part of the conflict doesn't necessarily mean that you don't want them to be uh, respecting IHL and you know respecting their their legal obligations to protect citizens and uh, and to fight you know to fight within the laws of war um, and and clearly that presents all sorts of complications in terms of how international aid agencies need to relate to militaries that are both parties to the conflict and potentially sort of involved in in providing assistance to citizens. Um, and how they relate to, to other parts of the government, and that's that's where I think I was saying. You know, it feels to me like sort of guidance and support in in helping international aid agencies to navigate those difficult dilemmas is, is somewhat lacking. Too much of the guidance on how you relate to militaries is actually about how you relate to 
the international military and peacekeeping forces. All right, thank you, Paul. Uh, maybe Vic, uh, any any views on that question uh, from your your experience in India? I mean, India being a, a very large country, but also a country with a couple of, of well minor conflicts uh, uh, on the continent, and one where the uh, where the military plays quite a major role in in terms of uh, responding to crisis. Yeah. Uh I think in India, uh, the armed forces have been playing a uh, very important role in disasters, addressing disaster management. And uh, over the years, I think the Indian government has also made huge investment by developing this National Disaster Response Force, the 10 battalions of which are dedicated for purely for search and rescue and the initial response. Uh, and uh, they get involved with this, uh, both these such and rescue and response operations in all uh, kind of uh, situations, including the complex where some elements of con uh, conflict are. Uh, I think the role of uh, military uh, is we see uh, in this situation, maybe from a civil military coordination point of view also is, whether it's the international military involved uh, with international humanitarian actors, that's where most of the discussions generally happen, but in the scenario of a, where it's a, a national host government and the national military coming in as an instrument with, you know, the good logistics and the mobility and to reach out to the people fast uh, for such rescue and for other operations, this, this makes a uh, makes a legal case, you know, to in, in terms of a saving lives and reaching out to with the needs properly there. Uh, so uh, also I think is there has been uh, even in the Bangladesh scenario, you know, I I've been following understanding there is a role which Bangladesh military also is playing towards that. And in the region, if I'm uh, there has been recently an exercise, you know, uh, the government of India is a BIMSTEC, the new regional association which is coming up, you know, India, Bangladesh, Myanmar, uh, Thailand, this Bay of Bengal, Wim countries. So there has been a military exercise, uh, NDRF and military exercise to look at their role in this uh, for the immediate disaster response. So I, I see that this kind of a role, uh, possibly uh, the way the uh, governments in this South Asia regions are looking at, maybe maybe I just not look at the South, Pakistan and the Afghanistan region, but it's going to possibly more be increasing uh, in time to come. So that, that's where my, now, uh, and maybe a bit also it is that uh, coming back in terms of our international humanitarian law and uh, uh, the situation where the conflict is involved, the people, yeah. So if in situations which are where India is, that's uh, be in couple of situation, uh, couple of states where there is. So that action is of dealing with looking at the people is more looking at the political process of uh, government uh, in engaging people with the polit political processes and there's yes, military's role is seen at that moment more professional, just entering the space for a critical search and rescue and immediate, you know, life-saving response needs. So that's what I've been in experience where has been the floods in Kashmir and some of the operations which is in the, in the uh, northeastern states of and the other and Indian Army has got involved. Thank you very much, Vika, for this very comprehensive uh, answer to that uh, to that question on the role of uh, militaries. Um, I've got a question for Arafat, but meanwhile, I would like to encourage uh, uh, all of uh, the participants to submit their questions uh, for the minutes that are remaining. Uh, Arafat, we have a question on uh, more on the setting of uh, the refugee coordination model, and uh, that was submitted by Mohammed, who's working in uh, in Yemen, and he's asking, uh, does the refugee coordination model adapt the role of the government depending on its level of governments, governance and stability? Yeah, that's an excellent question because on the one hand, uh, while the theory is that, uh, is that the protection responsibility lies with the government in practice, of course, uh, you have very different government responses from simply weak uh, governments that are unable to exercise their responsibility to governments that, uh, whether weak or strong, are unwilling to exercise it. And this is, this is precisely the role of international protection and all of this, where there is a well-functioning and well-capacitated system. Uh, we have uh, very little need to intervene, but where there are weaknesses, uh, we do. So yes, it, uh, we do very much. Um, we, we are flexible and customize it according to government capacity and willingness to protect. Thank you, uh, Arafat, for that for that answer. Um, Patricia, I'm going to come to you now for a question, and uh, this was submitted by Abel in uh, Iran. and. You know, you, you spoke earlier, one of the challenges is, you know, corruption, problems with the government, problems with interacting with the government, being asked, and being asked for bribe. And, uh, you know, obviously you have to watch out for your own integrity and your reputation of your organization. Um, any tips on, you know, how do you deal with that? How, do, how does your NGO or some of the NGOs you're familiar with deal with that in the Uganda situation? 
Okay, yeah, so in that case, it is not something that is officially done that they're, they're bribing you. It can be a personality issue within certain individuals working in the government. So you try to remain very professional and where, when you're not having very good success, you can work with UNHCR to help you on that issue because we know that OPM makes the final decision on who gets to accredited to work into the settlement, including when you submit your plans and, and budgets that, of what you're going to do. But also, if you're an IP for UNHCR, then that is much better and much easy. But, also, but for operating partners, I cannot speak for them because where, my, where I'm based in the IP for for UNHCR, so the situation is not very difficult because uh, OPM and UNHCR work very closely. But for the other, the the, the non UNHCR partners, the operating partners, they might have to maybe compromise a little bit. <laughs> I'm not so sure how they do it, but it, it's not something that m means that if you do not compromise, then you will not get get accredited. So it's also an issue of negotiating uh, cordially. Uh, thank, thank you for that. That's the best I can No, thank you for that advice, uh, keeping, the, keeping the negotiations cordial. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. So I will ask a, a, a last uh, question because I think we are reaching uh, the end of uh, um, soon at uh, the end of our uh, session today. And uh, the, this question is for Vic and was submitted by Sunil in uh, Sri Lanka. How do you work with the government when it comes to principled humanitarian action, especially when working with politicians, local authorities, who may have only some populations in their interest? Vic, the floor is yours. Thank you. I think it's a very uh, difficult question. Uh, that that's generally is a situation. Uh, we see that the where maybe the government uh, uh, certain, certain political political actors may have a particular preference for their uh, you know, particular constituencies when reaching out to beneficiaries. So uh, this situation, you know, we we look at it from a coordination platform, uh, applying, going back to the principles of uh, the humanity, impartiality, you know, making a case that uh, why they why they need to address to the holistically, you know, uh, more of an advocacy discussion uh, possibly with them, and then you know we look at the other uh, non-political actors, more of the uh, those who uh, the NGOs and those who regularly who follow the humanitarian code of conduct and the humanitarian principles to so look at you know that they address the, these whole these gaps more properly. But generally saying is there is in my experience of uh, uh, the Maintain coordination at a at a local level. Uh, we that we look at our direct uh, coordination with the NGOs and NGOs UN and other actors who are involved with our net with our with our network and also they subscribe to these maintain principles as one of the commitment to the whole process. But general, we don't have uh, a direct control over the political actors the way they're moving on to say this. Except for this advocacy and negotiation, I think we have not been able to do much about this. All right, thank you, Vic, for that. And I'm afraid, everybody, that we've come to the end of uh, our time for the Q&A. I'm going to, in a second, just give uh, the floor for one round of brief comments from all of our uh, presenters today. But just to let you know that, look, it's unfortunate that we can't possibly answer all of the questions. But we can always try to follow up with some of the unanswered questions with the speaker after the event. So we will try and do that on your behalf. And now, uh, just a, a very brief comment from, uh, from everybody. Uh, and I'll start with you, Patricia. Yeah. So yeah, I'm definitely very honored to have been a part of the panelists in this session, and I must say that uh, government of Uganda has done an extremely very excellent job in cooperating in the hosting of the refugees, and with a very good refugee progressive refugee policy in Uganda, open door policy, and um, we think this is a good uh, gesture of um, of regional cooperation. And uh, we, we believe that uh, this model can be replicated in several countries, an integrated model that ensures that refugees live in a, in a dignified life and can also be able to build on resilience. 
over time and not not live in a not live in a desperate situation. And within this model, we are also happy that the refugees are able to go their own food, engage in economic and sustainable livelihood activities. And um, this is a model that we believe if other refugee hosting countries can adopt, it would be it would be commendable. And um, I must still thank UNHCR and all the implementing partners. I'm, I'm sure that some that are participating in this call for the commendable work we are doing as a country in supporting the refugees. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia, for that, and thank you for underlining the importance of uh, you know the, the commitment uh, that Uganda has made uh, in a in a world where not so many countries have been as open and, and as welcoming to refugees. Arafat, uh, some final comments from you. Thank you, and I'd like to thank all the, the participants and, and the fellow speakers uh, for this. And just invite those of you, whether you're, you're working out in the deep field or at policy in your headquarters, uh, I hope we can, we can somehow or the other connect because we are looking towards the future. We are looking to how to preserve what we need from the refugee model, in, in particular the accountability, the focus on optimal delivery of services, the promise of the Sustainable Development Goals to leave no one behind, and the ability to, to be as inclusive as possible, uh, whether it's uh, whether it's through the current model or more likely through some uh, new form of, uh, of delivery, we hope that we can work together with you uh, and continue to, uh, to provide the protection and the assistance for refugees and other people of concern who, who need it. Thank you. Thank you, Arafat, for that. Uh, Vic, final comments from you. Uh, fellow speakers and everybody on the panel. Uh, uh, to me, it re-emphasize the importance of a government-led coordination. But along with the government, you know, I like to emphasize the need to build capacities for the locally-led uh, civil society coordination also. Uh, so while uh, in the new ways of working moving forward, so maybe wherever the international humanitarian community may get involved, they, they look at the, at the local level, it's more of a local level capacities are developed and the, and the coordination is more locally-led from civil society also along with the government. So I like to re-emphasize that. Thank you, Vic. And, and finally, Paul, uh, maybe some final comments from you. And, uh, and if, if I could impose a, a, a small question thrown into it, and that is, we've been talking about state-led coordination efforts, but what happens when the crisis is, you know, involving more than one state? Uh, Ebola, for instance, in West Africa comes to mind. Any, any, anything that's being done on that side within this state-led model? Um, well, in quick answer to that question, there's also all sorts of interesting initiatives at regional level. So, you know, the, 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 the humanitarian role of ASEAN or the African Union or, or, you know, regional bodies at different levels, most recently in the Caribbean around, around the hurricane response. Um, final thoughts, I guess, uh, Patricia mentioned cordiality. I mean, for, for me, you know, ideas of sort of cordiality, respect are important in this debate. Um, and and it, it's about creating a sort of constructive, respectful, principled dialogue between international aid actors and states that recognizes the sort of sovereign authority of states and and doesn't assume either that they're sort of always benevolent or that they're always incompetent or incompetent or corrupt. It, it's about sort of a what's on all recognition of the of, of, of you know the, the, the central role of states and respecting that whilst advocating on the behalf of disaster affected populations and finding coordination models that have those, you know, respectful and coordinated cordial negotiations able to happen. But won't always be easy. They'll sometimes be tough because governments don't always respect the needs and rights of population. Um, so it's finding the right balance of sort of not too supine, not too antagonistic ways of having principled debates with governments about their roles to protect and assist their citizens and where international action fits into that. Okay, thank you, Paul. Well, everyone, we've come to the end of our session today. Uh, please do not leave the webinar platform before filling in the survey. Your feedback, your feedback is vital uh, to us for how we organize future events. Before concluding the session, I'd just like to inform you that the audio and video recordings of today's session and mentioned resources will be available in the next few days on the event webpage. So once, once translated, the video recording will be available also with subtitles in French and Arabic. Yes, thank you, Mark. And I would like also to mention that uh, IGVA will soon publish a briefing paper on uh, the topics that were discussed today, uh, which will be also available in French and Arabic. Uh, I take also this opportunity to announce that our next Learning Stream uh, series will be focusing on the humanitarian development and peace nexus, and it, will, uh, it should start on, uh, in the first quarter of 2018. 
Also, finally, a quick uh, reminder to, about uh, the previous session on uh, global and country level coordination uh, mechanism, but also on NGO coordination through um, NGO fora and consortia, NGO engagement with uh, OCHA and the new way of working. So you can now access the audio and video recordings of all these events by clicking on each title. And ICVA will also uh, publish briefing papers for each topic in the coming months. Last but not least, thank you all for your provocative uh, and proactive involvement in the chat and sending in your interesting questions. And a big special thanks to our panelists today, Patricia, Arafat, Vikrant, and Paul, for briefing us on these uh, coordination mechanisms and helping us to understand them better. Again, I invite you all to fill in the survey after the event. And uh, from me and on behalf of the PHAP team, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you all. Thanks to all the participants.